field of user experience has been around for a few decades now, but still many organisations are new to adopting UX practices and professions. At our virtual conference, Jacob Nielsen discussed common objections to UX found in organisations with low UX maturity, why these objections are misguided, and why UX is still needed. It may seem strange to discuss why UX at the UX conference, since one would assume that people who are attending a conference with this name are already interested in user experience and just want to learn how to do it better. But even though we had several thousand great participants at the UX conference, there are millions more people in many companies and development projects who stand in the way of better user interfaces because they don't believe in UX. So I want to explain why I think we should do UX. I have three arguments in favor of UX. I have anecdotal evidence, I have a conceptual reason, and finally I have statistical data. Let's start with the anecdote. Up until 1971, the UK had an unusual money system where one pound was worth 20 shillings and each shilling was worth 12 pence. So now, how many pennies are there in a pound? Uh, that was not easy. Almost all other countries have currencies where you know, one big unit is worth 100 small units, which makes it very easy to read prices and do various calculations with the money. But the UK had this more complicated currency with three units. There had been many calls to simplify the British money, but they had used the old system for hundreds of years, and people were very used to it. In fact, a proposal to modernize the money was voted down by Parliament in 1955. So they were stuck with complicated money. I remember when I was a kid in Denmark, we spent several hours in English classes in school learning about the British money system so that we would have a chance to understand the prices and how to use the coins if we visited London. Finally, in 1971, the UK went ahead and simplified their money to the same principle used everywhere else, and one pound would be worth 100 pennies. But they were very worried that people would have trouble using the new money since everybody had so much experience with the old system. In fact, they had something called the Decimal Currency Board, which ran advertisements like this one, to explain to people how to use the new money. In, in this ad, they were teaching people that the new 50 pence coin, just like the one still in use today, should be used like a 10 shilling note. Remember that a pound used to be worth 20 shillings, so 10 shillings were half a pound. Therefore, 50 pennies are also worth half a pound in the new decimal currency. They had this big campaign, and the plan was to keep educating the population for quite some time. But it turned out not to be necessary. Very quickly, people in the UK started using the new money with no problems, and the information campaign was stopped. Why was this? It's because they changed from a difficult system to an easy system. Now, if they'd gone the other way around and replaced something easy, with something more complicated, then they would have needed a lot more education. But easy beats difficult. Of course, this was only an, an anecdote, but in general, people do use easy things more and don't complain about them. My second argument in favor of UX is the conceptual one. It's based on one of our most fundamental slogans, which is, you are not the user. And by you, I mean anybody who is working on a design project. We all know that the only way to judge a user interface is to watch real users from the target audience use the product. But people who are not user experience professionals often make judgment on design based on their personal preferences. This is when you can bring up this slogan, you are not the user. Even better, you can play to the vanity of the other members of your project team. You can tell them, you are too smart and you know too much. That's something that most people like to hear, so they'll be more receptive to your message. 
it's not just flattery. It's almost always true that programmers and other people on the project team are in fact more intelligent than the average user. For sure, everybody who works on a project knows enormously much more about it than any outside user. So yeah, you flatter people by saying that they are too smart, which again means that what they think is easy might not be easy at all for the target audience. It's a quite logical argument, which is something developers like. That was my conceptual argument in favor of UX. Uh, now to my third argument, the statistical one based on data. I have uh, two numbers for you, 75 and 11. The important thing about these two numbers is that 75 is bigger than 11. Actually, a lot bigger. 75% is the average improvement in UX metrics after designing for usability across a large number of projects we studied. Now, it is the average, so some designs improve by less than 75%. But other designs improve by more than 75%. In any case, the average improvement was 75%. On the other hand, 11% was the average percentage of a project team that was devoted to user experience. Again, across a large number of projects teams we studied. Certainly some projects had less than 11% UX staff, but some had more. The average was 11%. So you spend 11% of your development budget on UX, and what you gain from that is a 75% improvement in the outcome. This is a really good bargain and a strong statistical argument in, in favor of UX. Definitely, some projects spend more or get less, but on average, the return on investment from UX is incredibly high, and higher than most other things you can spend money on in a company. These were my three arguments in favor of UX, but there are also arguments against UX, and I'll discuss four of the main counter arguments. The first argument against UX is that we can fix it in training. We don't need to waste time on all these UX methods, but we can simply teach users how to operate the design. This is actually true. Humans are very adaptable, and they are capable of learning. So, yeah, with enough training, People can learn how to use almost any design, almost, no matter how bad it is. But even though it is true that we could fix bad UX by more training, this is not realistic in most cases. For sure, for a website, there's no such thing as a training course. There's not even such a thing as reading the manual before using the website. On the web, users take one look at the homepage. If they can't figure it out, they just leave. For enterprise software, we have more control over the users, and we can force them to go to a training class. <laughs> but in the real world, there's employee turnover, and pretty soon you have new employees using the software who never got the training course. Also, these training courses are really expensive. It's not just the cost of the instructor. We also have to pay for all these employees' time while they're sitting in the training course instead of doing the work they're supposed to be paid for. Really, the cost of training is the cost of bad usability. I like to think of company training budgets as like a big juicy pork chop just ready to be eaten by better usability. Now, maybe you can't completely eliminate training, but it should definitely be possible to cut the training budget in half by better UX design. The second argument against UX is that a good designer should know how to make a good design without all these extra studies. So just hire good designers and let them loose without all this UX overhead. And again, there's some truth to this. That's what's so insidious about all of these arguments against UX, that there is an element of truth in all of them. Yes, a good designer will make better designs than a bad designer. That's more or less a definition of what's a good designer. But a good designer will make even better designs when following proper UX methodology. Even the best designer will not create a perfect user interface in the first attempt. The first design will always get better 
after user testing and another design iteration. And the more iterations, the better the result. Also, how did the, the good designer get to be good in the first place? One of the ways is to pay attention to user research so that the designers know what designs work and don't work with their target audience. The third argument against UX is that everybody is a UXer. Now that we are targeting total user experience and a broader definition of design than just like the icons and menus on the screen. When UX is everybody's responsibility, we don't need a specialized UX staff. Again, yes, we do want total user experience and everybody on the product team should care about user experience and work to improve it. But that does not mean that we can do without specialists. When something is everybody's responsibility, it usually ends up being nobody's responsibility. And when people work on things they are not experts on, they usually do a bad job. We need everybody to care about UX. For example, I think everybody who works on a design project should have observed a few sessions of user testing. But that doesn't mean that they should run these studies or that they should do the more advanced data analysis and redesign. That's the job of dedicated UX professionals. The fourth argument against UX is that analytics is God. We just have to run an A-B test and wait for like a booming voice from above to declare, design B is a better. Well, yes, analytics is a useful data source and the design that wins an A-B test is usually the one you should use. But this begs the question of how you came up with design A and design B in the first place. That requires design work and solid UX insight into what aspects of the product are worth experimenting with. Also, total user experience is not just a matter of individual screen elements. First of all, we actually need to pick features that users need. And then we need a strong interface architecture and a conceptual model for the interaction. All these Big picture design questions require UX insights. And then you can always polish them off with A-B testing as well. Those are four strong arguments against UX. But as I said, I don't think that they hold water if you dig into them a little more than most people seem to do. Now I would like to turn to why UX works. Most of all, it works because people are different, but not that different. It's because people are different that we need to do UX based on this principle I mentioned before that you are not the user. We can't just decide on a design based on whether we like it ourselves. We need methods to find out how real users will use the design. But at the same time, people are not that different, which is why it's enough to test with a small number of users after a handful of test participants you know the big picture. The real issue in user interface design is not so much the differences between different individual users, but the difference between humans and computers, which is much bigger. And the difference between people inside a company and the customers outside the company, which is also huge. These two differences are what we have to study. But we don't need to study them with that many users, which is why UX is cheap and has that huge return on investment that I mentioned before. We do need to look at all the details in a user interface. And this reminds me of the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, HMS Pinafore. In Pinafore, there's a character named Sir Joseph, and uh, Sir Joseph is the first Lord of the Admiralty, which basically means that he's the head of the British Navy. He sings a song about how he got this position, and it starts like this. When I was a lad, I served a term as office boy to an attorney's firm. I cleaned the windows and I swept the floor, and I polished up the handle on the big front door. I polished that handle so carefully that now I am the ruler of the Queen's Navy. And the Queen is, of course, Queen Victoria. 
I think this has a lot of lessons for UX. We do need to polish the handle or the details of the user interface carefully. It's very common for design to be completely doomed because there's an icon or a label or a link that users don't understand. A single wrong word can mean that users don't use a feature or that they use it wrong. So UX requires close attention to the details. At the same time, Sir Joseph is not really a good role model for us. Because later in the song, he goes on to say that the only ship he ever had seen was the partnership at the law firm. And his advice for getting ahead in the Navy is to stay close to your desk and never go to sea. Now, this may work in some bureaucratic organizations, but it's bad advice for UX. In UX, the way to get good is to get away from your desk and be with the users. In fact, being a user experience professional is like being a coal miner. You can only say that you're a coal miner if you're at the coal face. Similarly, you can only say you're a UX professional if you're with users a lot. Finally, let us step back and look at the big picture of UX. I would like to look at the period from 1950 to 2100. This 150 year period can be divided into three big eras for UX. The first era was the dark ages of UX. From the field started around 1950 to the dot com bubble around year 2000. I actually worked in UX during the last 17 years of the dark ages. I can testify those were in fact very dark for UX. There was no respect for user experience. There were almost no jobs, and it was hard to get any funding. Most design was made with blatant disregard for usability principles. User interfaces were truly terrible in those days. Those of you who have never had to suffer on the mainframe user interfaces or the vast majority of DOS software, <laughs> you should just count yourself lucky. It was bad, bad I say. In fact, user interfaces were so bad during the dark ages, I think they count as a fourth argument in favor of UX, in addition to the three I mentioned in the beginning of this talk. This is more of a counterfactual argument. The experience from those bad years shows us that not UX leads to miserable software. UX did grow very slowly during what I call the dark ages, but the real turning point came with the dot-com bubble around year 2000. Before the web, the time sequence was that first you give the company money, buy the software, and only then do you get the user experience. By the time you discover that the product is hard to use, ah, they already have your money. On the other hand, with the web, the sequence of these two events has been swapped. First you have the user experience. First you go to the homepage, you try to navigate the site to find what you want, you try to understand the product description and see if you can use the shopping cart. If yes, all these design elements are fine, only then do you give them the money. So it used to be money first, UX second, but starting with dot-com bubble, it became UX first, money second. This of course vastly increased companies' motivation to invest in UX and get it right. This is the era we're in right now, growing acceptance of UX. This does not mean that everybody is doing everything we recommend. In fact, we've done studies of the UX maturity levels in different companies, and most are right now at a fairly low level of UX maturity, stage three of our six point scale. They do some UX, but they don't quite do it right. But it's getting better. Every year, more companies invest in UX, and over time, most companies move up to the higher levels of UX maturity. My prediction is that around 2050, we will have reached the point where most companies have mature UX practices. Of course, not everybody. But basically, all important companies will have good UX processes. After another 50 years of most projects using good UX practices, I think we'll finally get user interfaces that are good enough 
that computers are truly suitable for humans. I don't pre predict perfect user interfaces by the year 2100, but I think we'll get to the stage where most of our troubles are over and people no longer struggle to use computers. Many of you may think that 2100 is a long time from now, and you might even be in UX when that year comes around. But I don't think this is a reason to despair. There is a 150 year period from the start of UX as a discipline to the time when we have reached our main goals. Right now, we're about halfway through this 150 year period. But even though we are 49% of the way when counted a number of years, I think we're only about 2% of the way in terms of user interface quality or the impact of UX on humanity. This, of course, means that 98% of our results are still to come. And that means it will be extremely exciting to be in UX during these next years. I don't necessarily predict that you know, this year will be the year of UX, because there can always be setbacks. But I safely predict that the 21st century is the century of UX. You may not be the one to reach the big goal in 2100, but you will be part of pushing ahead and achieving many of these big gains. We still have far to go in UX, but the journey is the reward. So go ahead and enjoy that you live during the growing acceptance phase and that you will make things better and better for the rest of your career. Thank you.